نحمده ونصلي على رسول النبي الكريم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إحدنا السراط المستقيم سراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين قال الله تعالى في شان حبيبي إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا سلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل وسلم بارك على سيدنا ولان محمد طب القلوب ودوائها وعافية الأبدان وشفائها ونور الأبسار وديائها وعلى آله وصحبه دائما أبدا سلاة وسلاما عليك يا سيدي يا رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم. I know the video is not working in the back, so inshallah next time. But we've been talking about the Hajj. You know, one of our brothers had made intention of going on Hajj this year. Actually, he made it last year, and then the COVID thing happened, and then this year again, and the same thing. You know, last year they only allowed 10,000 people to come and make the Hajj. And this year they're saying up to 60,000 people, but all of them will be locals. Um, you know, and this is one of the things that Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has told us. One of the signs of the hour is that the Hajj and the Umrah will be abandoned. You know, and there have been times in history when people were, un when were unable to make the Hajj. But those were times when an army was invading or other, you know, military issues were ongoing, so people weren't able to come for the Hajj. You know, not because there was a fear of being sick. People that go for the Hajj, they know, or people that have gone for the Hajj, you know, getting sick there, you know, it's not uncommon. Everyone gets a cough. Um, you know, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala He's created this system, and as we said, you know, like when Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made his Hajj, you know, and in Arafat, one of the companions, he fell off of his camel and was martyred in that sense. But Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said that he told the companions that to bury him in his ihram, and that Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala would raise him up on the Day of Judgment, saying Labbaik. You know, there have been many years when cholera spread and many people passed away because of cholera during the Hajj and various other things. You know, the interesting thing is if you look at, you know, if you look go on YouTube and you look at Makkah Live now, even though every single person there has been vaccinated, because in order to get in, you have to be vaccinated. And now this year, you, they have a special card that they will have to carry. Uh, so that no one who's unvaccinated can get in. Yet they're still making them socially distance. You know, Rasulullah said, close, close the gaps in your rows. And do not allow shaitan to come in between you. You have organizations, you know, and, and you know, I'm not saying this just to be saying this. You know, I'm not saying this because I don't know. Those who know me know who I am. And they know that I'm an internist. That I know the background to all of this stuff. So if you look at the statistics as far as what the statistics that are published, you know, if you got the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, you know, it's, they claim that it's 85% effective against serious illness, 100% effective against death. <laughs> However that is. But that's their claim. You know, Pfizer are very similar and, and Moderna, the same thing. So if you accept those numbers, then, and you're claiming that all of these people have been vaccinated, then what are you concerned about? 
But Rasulullah SAW tells us one thing. And these organizations that have an agenda that is anti-Islamic, they tell us something else. And the people choose to follow those organizations. You know, you look at these governments, so-called Muslim governments. You look through their history, what have they done? They've done nothing except sold out the believers. You know, the, as we've talked about before, you know, the Abrahamic Accords. UAE, Morocco, Sudan, uh, Bahrain. Saudi was about to do it, but then, you know, the administration got changed. What are they doing? Selling out Philistine. Before that, what did they do, the Saudis? They made an agreement with Moody in India, sold out Kashmir. Every chance they get. And people say, oh, these are the Muslim leaders, because they, they title themselves as, as Khadim, Khadim al Haramain, Sharif. This is their title. You know, it's like we say in the South here, it says, you know, even if you put a you know, suit on a pig, it's still a pig. You can put any label on things you want, it doesn't change the fact of what it is. You know, these aren't things new. The only difference is in the past they used to do it under the table. But they did the same thing. Now they're just blatantly open about it. Because they have brainwashed the people to thinking that, oh, these are our leaders, we can't say anything against them. And so, but everything that Rasulullah Sallallahu has told us is true. Everything that he has told us will happen, will happen. And everything we see in the world that is happening, he has already told us that it will happen. You know, like in the Battle of Badr, Rasulullah he told the companions before the battle where each of them would fall, each of the Quraysh leaders, where they would fall. And the hadith is in Bukhari. Abdullah ibn Masood is the narrator. He says he told us names of 14 of them, Abu Jahl, where he would fall. Abu Lahab, not Abu Lahab, uh, Utbah, Shayba, Wali. Umayya bin Khalid, all of these, where they would fall. And later on, Abdullah ibn Masood, he says, I went and I looked, and they did not fall an inch this way or an inch that way. Exactly where he said. And so everything we are seeing, he has already told us. If we are ignorant of it, that's our own problem. But even though we know these things are going to happen, but the other command is that if we can't do anything else about it, we at least hate it in our hearts. And we don't even do that anymore. You know, I mean, the people of Yemen have been totally forgotten. Why? Because the so-called Muslim leaders are the ones that are bombing them. But coming back now to the Hajj again. You know, like we talked about that we were talking about the Hajj of Rasulullah. And we mentioned, you know, we, last week we got to the point where, you know, they completed the Hajj and now they were setting out. Again, another point to remember, a couple of points to remember that we talked about last week. One is, on the 10th of Zil Hajj, you know, where four things are done. You have the stoning of Jamaratul Uqba, you have the sacrifice of the animals, you have the shaving of the head, or the cutting of the hair, and you have tawaf-i-ziyarah. 
So these four things. And when the companions, because some of them didn't do them in order, they came and they asked and they said, Ya Rasulullah some is this a sin? That we did not do them in order. And he said, No. A sin is to is to attack the honor and the respect of a believer. And so this connects to the next thing that we're mentioning now. Because, of course, the greatest of believers is Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because of whom we become believers. You, know, you, you do not become a believer simply by saying La ilaha illallah. You have to say Muhammad Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But then we see Sayyidina Ali, Karam Allah Waj. And as I mentioned last week, there are only two companions of Rasulullah Sallallahu for whom Rasulullah Sallallahu would not tolerate any criticism. You know, people would come and complain about Umar, that he's hard, he's this, he's that. And Rasulullah Sallallahu would hear them out. They would come, come and complain. They'd have, you know, disputes among themselves. But of course, who did they, who would they come to when the dispute occurred? They would come to Rasulullah, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and he would hear them out. And whatever, whatever he decided for them, they loved it. But with Abu Bakr. Siddiq and Sayyidina Ali he would not even listen to any complaints against them and if anyone did complain against them then they themselves became chastised and so as we mentioned because of what had happened with the army that Ali was bringing back from Yemen and of course he left the army because he knew that they couldn't reach Mecca in time for the Hajj so he left them and came by himself so he could move more quickly. He makes the Hajj with the Rasulullah. So when the army arrives, you know, they've changed their clothes. He tells them to put on, put on your old clothes so that Rasulullah himself will distribute the, the spoils. They complain to Rasulullah in Mina. The Rasulullah asked them, that, am, I, am I not closer to the believers than their own selves? And Nabi Allah bil mu'minina min anfusihim. They said, of course. And he said, then to whomever I am close, Ali is also close. Discussion ended at that moment. But when they set out from, from Mecca back for Medina Munawwara, on the way, complaints came again. And now, at a place called Ghadir Khum. You know, this is basically an oasis in the middle of the desert. So they have stopped there. But Rasulullah Sallallahu he makes Salat al -Tuhar. And then he gathers everybody. So all of these companions who had come for the Hajj, you know, 124,000 companions who had come for the Hajj, some of them remained in Mecca, some of them went back to wherever they had come from. The majority of them are now traveling with Rasulullah back to Medina Munawwara. So he calls them all. He gathers all of them. And he brings and he comes to a high, high spot so that everybody can see. And he has with him Ali. And he holds the hand of Sayyidina Ali and he raises it up and then he makes the statement of Man kunta mawla, fahada aliyun mawla. That for whomsoever I am his mawla. Ali, this Ali. Fahada aliyun mawla. This Ali is also his mawla. So if you accept Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi as your mawla, as your friend, as your protector, as the one that you love, then you also have to accept Sayyidina Ali. 
You cannot separate the two. You know, if you look, there's a terminology of hadith. You have hadith and marfu, which is hadith where it goes back all the way to where a companion heard it directly from Rasulullah. You have hadith and mursal, where a tabi'i says that I heard that, that Rasulullah said. He doesn't say who he heard it from. So this terminology is also important to understand. You have what is known as matawatir. Matawatir is hadith that is translated, transmitted through multiple chains. It's not specified how many, but multiple ch chains, three, four, five, or more. So that it's very hard to doubt its, its authenticity. You also have hadith mashur, mashur. And this is something, so mutawatir is something that's considered common knowledge am among the companions of Rasulullah. Hadith mashur is something that may not have been common knowledge among the companions of Rasulullah, but it gained enough uh, uh, recognition that it became common knowledge among the Tabi. If you look at this statement of Rasulullah, there is no hadith that is more mutawatir than this. You have 29, at least 29 different companions of Rasulullah narrating it. Going all the way back to Rasulullah. It is the only hadith that is narrated by all 10 of the Ashram of Ashra. Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, Abdurrahman bin Auf, Abu Ubaid bin Jarrah, Sayyid bin Zayd, Talha bin Ubaidullah, um, Sa'ad bin Abi Waqas, Zubair bin Awam, Radiallahu Anhu, all of them have narrated it. But it's interesting how people attack the hadith. You know, this also gets back to where Rasulullah said about Sayyidina Ali radiallahu that only a believer will love you and only a, a hypocrite will have animosity against you. So it's interesting how people expose their hypocrisy. You know, I was listening to a, a clip, two scholars, you know, one from the Oban, actually both of them from the Oban background. So one of them said, Mawla Ali. And he mentioned the hadith, and he says this. The other one is now attacking him. And his attack upon him is that, oh, see, he, he's mentioned this weak hadith from Abu Dawood. So he only mentions one narration. He skips over all the other 28 narrations. He skips over that the, the uh, hadith is also in Tirmizi ibn Majah. And Tabari has mentioned it through very strong chains. And various other scholars have mentioned it. Again, multiple narrators. You know, but he, he, the listeners though, who don't know the background to it, they, they hear this and say, oh, this is, this is weak. Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal, you know, when his son Abdullah asked him about the status and the honor of Sayyidina Ali, he said many things, among which he also, he said, he said, you know, if you want to understand, you know, the, the position of Ali, then also, all you have to understand is that Ali had many enemies. No shortage of enemies. You know, because in Badr he killed 36 of, of the leaders of Quraysh, who all have families, so now they have an issue with Ali. In Uhud he killed many in all the battles, though through, through his life 40,000 people he killed. All for Allah and his messenger. So all those 40,000 have multiple families who have friends. So now they all have an issue with Ali.
So he says that Ali had many enemies. But none of them could produce anything. None of them could come up with any argument or any legitimate argument against Ali. You know, if you look at these days, you know, everybody's exposed. You know, you, know, you do a little something and suddenly, oh, the internet, everybody knows. You know, it wasn't any different back then. The only difference is now it's video. Back then it was all verbal and rumors spread very quickly. But even with all of that, they couldn't produce anything against Adi. And he said that there are more verses of the Quran that are revealed in, in the honor of Ali than any other companion of Rasulullah. And there are more say hadith excoling or, or showing us the status and the honor and the and the virtues of Sayyidina Ali than any other companion of Rasulullah So he tells this to his son. Another way that people attack him, you know, I was reading a book. And the title of the, the book is, is about the virtues of Ali. And so, you know, they mention some general things. And then in the back, they start going to hadith, through hadith. Oh, this hadith is modu, this hadith is modu. So they take the hadith where Rasulullah he says that, that the Quran and Ali will always be together until they meet me at the Hawd on the Day of Judgment. He said, oh, this is Modu. Modu meaning this is fabricated. Because he also, the, the writer understands that most people don't know the hadith and say Muslim, where Rasulullah he says that my family and the Quran will always be together. My itrat, my lineage and the Quran will always be together until they meet me at the Hawd. Or rather, even until they meet me at the Hawd on the Day of Judgment. So the question now comes, is not Sayyidina Ali among the family? And he's not just anyone among the family. When Rasulullah married him to his daughter, and Rasulullah said that this was a marriage that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had decided in the heavens, that when he married him to his daughter, Bibi Fatima, salamullah alayha, he says to his daughter, he says that I have married you to the best man, to the best man from amongst my family. And when the Jews of, or when the Christians of Najran, they came to debate with Rasulullah, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. You know, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, after, after the debate, and they had lost the debate, and just like, you know, when you're talking to someone here, you know, they say, but I still believe that Jesus is my Savior. You know, so after he lays out all the proofs, and they have no response, but we still believe. And that was the end. Or that was their final statement. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in Surah Ali Imran, what does he say? He says, do mubahila with them. They call Abna Ana wa Abna Abu. Wanisa Ana wa Nisa Abu. Wan Fusina Wan Fusab. They call their, uh, you call your sons and they call their sons and you call your women and they call their women and you call yourself and they call themselves. Who did Rasulullah take as himself, as a self? Ali. And he brings them under the cloak. And when he brings all of these four, Imam Hassan, Imam Hussein, Alayhi Salam, Bibi Fatima, Salam, Ulalay, and Sayyidina Ali, Karam Allah, Waj, when he brings them under the cloak, what does he say? He says, Allahumma ha ulahi ahli. That, oh Allah, this is my family.
So when people, you know, you don't have to attack the honor of Ali Radhan directly. Or you don't, you know, you don't even have to attack anyone's honor directly. You do it indirectly, and that's what they do. Because they know if they do it directly, it, it exposes them. Obvious, you know, it's obviously who, obvious who they are. But now they can always come up with an excuse. Oh, I didn't mean this. I meant that. Yet they're exposing themselves. If we're too blind to see it, again, that's our fault. You know, it, it's, you know, and, and the defense they use, oh, you know, this guy that was attacking this other scholar, he's saying, oh, see, you know, he's made this statement, Mawla Ali, so now he's, he's given uh, strength to the Shia. You know, that's like saying, oh, we shouldn't praise Isa al Islam because then, you know, the Christians, it gives strength to the Christians. It's nonsense. My praising, praising Isa al Islam does not make a difference in the status of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In fact, it actually increases that, uh, it increases that status in my understanding because of Rasulullah Sallallahu because if my understanding of Sayyidina Isa Alayhi Salaam, of Nabi Isa Alayhi Salaam, is, is very elevated, Rasulullah Sallallahu is Sayyidul Anbiya. He is the master and the leader of the prophets. So if somebody is hesitant to praise Ali Radhan because he thinks, oh, the Sh it gives strength to the Shias, then he needs to stop praising Musa al Islam or Isa al Islam. And again, if we start talking about the virtues of Sayyidina Ali, Karamallah Wajid, you know, it won't end. Uh, Rasulullah Sallallahu he told us, he said, he said that to look upon the Kaaba is ibadah. And to look at the Kaaba is the worship of Allah. Most of us remember this. But unfortunately, most of us also forget that he also said to look upon Ali is ibadah. And the narrator of this is Bibi Aisha Siddiqah radiallahu anha. Because she noticed after Rasulullah Sallallahu Of course, during the time of Rasulullah Sallallahu when the companions were sitting, you know, their whole focus and attention was upon whom? It was upon Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. After Rasulullah Sallallahu she noticed that her father, Abu Bakr Siddiq, he had always, the whole gathering is going on, but his focus was always on Sayyidina Ali, radiallahu anhu. Somebody else is talking, he's still looking at Ali. So she asked him, she said, why is this? So he says, because I heard Rasulullah Sallallahu saying that to look upon Ali is ibadah. It is the worship of Allah. You know, just like when you look upon the Kaaba, it should remind you that this is Baytullah, this is the house of Allah, so it reminds you of Allah. So you look upon Ali and it reminds you that Ali, that this is the creation of Allah. And what a wonderful creation. that none of the enemies of Allah or His Messenger وسلم, could stand in front of Him. The conqueror of Khaybar. Literally the sword of Rasulullah. <laughs> that there is no youth, there is no young man except Ali, and there is no sword except Dhul Fiqar. I'll end here today, inshallah. Uh, we'll pick up, and we'll, next week, inshallah, we'll start talking about the conversation between Abu Bakr Shibli rahmatullahi and his student uh, in regards to the Hajj, inshallah, as far as looking at the spiritual aspects and their spiritual connections with the actions of the Hajj, inshallah.
So those who have not made Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us and guide us and protect us and fill our hearts with his true love and the true love of his beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his family, his companions and all of those whom they love, inshallah. Those who have not made sunnah, go ahead and make sunnah, inshallah.